Good morning. Um, I'm Doug Wood, Chair of the Department. For those of you that don't know, hopefully many of you know, um, but uh, I wanted to do a little introduction of this morning's Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Marcourt to actually introduce our speaker, who we're very happy to have here. But I wanted to do an introduction because uh, this is a special Grand Rounds. Many of our Grand Rounds are special, but this one is uh, unique in the sense that over the past couple of years, the chairs of the Departments of Surgery at Stanford, UCSF, UC Davis, Oregon Health Sciences, and University of Washington um, have had lots of discussions about creating a partnership uh, to bring visiting professors reciprocally to each of our programs, and specifically uh, to focus people on early to mid-career, uh, people that um, might not yet uh, be uh, going to national uh, visiting professorships, but an experience of both allowing networking within our institutions that can enhance research, clinical partnerships, and education, um, but also to have us get a chance to know each other and uh, some experience uh, on both sides, on the receiving side, our side as an institution, uh, getting to know Dr. Brown. Um, and hopefully, Dr. Brown also getting to know us and getting to know some of the people at UW that might foster relationships or partnerships uh, in the future. So um, we're very excited to uh, finally launch what we've been working on for a couple of years amongst the, the chairs of those five departments of surgery. Um, and just to round it out, the person from our institution uh, that was selected for this is Dr. Teresa Kim, and uh, she's going to be going to UCSF uh, for her part of uh, this partnership that we have amongst the five departments. So uh, I just wanted people to know about that, to know what we're doing. Um, I'm excited to have Dr. Brown here. We had a good dinner together last night, and I'll turn things over to Dr. Marcourt to uh, do a more formal introduction of Dr. Brown. Yes, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds. And Dr. Brown, thank you for joining us as being our inaugural speaker for the Pacific Invited Professor Project. Um, so I will keep this robust but short because I know Dr. Brown has lots of great things to talk to us about. So he uh, has been a prolific person in the best sense of the word. He started his career at the University of Chicago uh, in medicine. Uh, and then not only got a doctor of medicine, but a PhD in immunology uh, in that process. He then transitioned to the University of California, San Francisco for residency in general surgery, uh, and then to UC Davis for trauma critical care fellowship. And I will say, uh, I'm, I am certain that UC Davis would concur with my statement that they were fortunate to retain him at UC Davis after fellowship. Uh, and as I said, he has been successful and prolific in the best sense of the word uh, during both his training and his career. He has more than 30 peer-reviewed articles uh, to his credit, uh, and he has also been the primary or co-investigator for six grants in his short academic, uh, relatively short uh, tenure as faculty thus far, with over $3 million uh, to date. And I think to round out more than just the sort of trauma immunology um, uh, part of his career. I think it's really profound to say that he has received many awards from prestigious uh, organizations, both awards and fellowships, to include UCSF, the American College of Surgeons, the Eastern Association for Trauma, the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, the Society of Black Academic Surgeons, the NIH, and of course, his home institution of UC Davis. Um, I think also these accolades are interesting because they are not only for his work in trauma and immune response, but also for his work in injury prevention, community engagement, and also for outstanding compassion in the work that he does. So Dr. Brown, on behalf of our department, I want to thank you again for being here, and we're very excited to uh, hear about your work. 
Good morning, all, and thank you so much for having me here. This has really been a great pleasure. As I was uh, sharing earlier this morning, my last interaction with University of Washington was a little bit more confrontational, involved a running back named Napoleon Kaufman, who was pretty explosive. Uh, so this is much more friendly. Um, so uh, as stated earlier, my two main research um, foci are violence prevention and peace selecting, uh, stemming back from my um, basic science origins. And uh, it's always a little bit of a struggle to share basic science. Um, so I'll try to see what I can do to make it really relevant to keep everyone uh, really engaged. I will say, if y'all will permit me as an aside, when I was in grad school, they gave me this little scut work project where they told me to inject some mice with some cells while I was not, you know, too busy. And it turned out it was a collaboration with a guy named Dr. Hanjo. And it was actually the first demonstration that PD-1, PD-1 ligand interactions could actually cause cancer regression if blocked. And he won the Nobel Prize. And it was just like this thing and we had to go author paper. So, oh, I recognize someone. How you doing? <laughs> uh, first, uh, no disclosures. Um, and then I will move on. So I think to start with, we'll start with a case because I think that uh, always sort of seats the, the relevance of the basic science. So we had a patient who was a 74 year old man who was struck by a car. Um, he was pretty banged up. He had uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage, pulmonary contusions, lung lacerations, pneumothorax, um, T2 and 3 spinal cord or sp spine injury, uh, flailed chest and scapular fracture. He was taken emergently to the operating room, had left thoracotomy, a left lower lobectomy with a wedge resection, and then postoperatively was pretty unstable. Uh, ended up having uh, what, what you can see there is a, is a PE, pretty good size PE, um, as indicated by the arrow sign. Required ECMO um, on post-injury day two, a repeat CT of the head demonstrated increased subarachnoid hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage. We had to stop his anticoagulation, which had been started for the massive PE that he had. Um, he remained on ECMO for a few days and then we, and we switched over the ECMO to not use heparin and then uh, went back and restarted heparin on post-op day five. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we, we took him to the vascular lab and never found a deep vein thrombosis. So, actually, let me go back. And just to hint at that, um, we see this a lot where we see early blunt thoracic trauma and we'll oftentimes find incidents of, of what we call pulmonary emboli um, without evidence necessarily of deep vein thrombosis. And as I will hint to, uh, a little bit later in the presentation, we think that that's actually not embolic event, but actually a primary uh, thrombotic event in situ. And so this is just highlighting the, comp the, uh, the challenge in managing a patient that presents early on with a clot like that in their, in their vasculature. And early on, unlike with classic PEs, um, if you're starting to anticoagulate, you're doing so in the setting where the risk of bleeding is significantly higher due to potential solid organ injury or traumatic brain injury. And so it, it can be pretty complicating if you, if you have um, respiratory issues or heart strain, for example. So that kind of gets us to where we are now. And we see that things like that are showing us that there is a need to sort of shift some of our resuscitation priorities and incorporate things that had never been considered previously. So historically, we know about, you know, restoring the volume, you got to fill the pipes back up, you want to make sure you're carrying oxygen to the tissues. And you want to, and later on, we figured out, you know, if you give them volume without anything else, then you end up diluting the uh, coagulation factors and sort of causing a coagulopathy. So we also focus now on restoration of soluble coagulation factors. But increasingly, we've become aware that in the setting of trauma resuscitation, you have some endotheliopathy occurring and you need to restore the integrity of the vascular component as well. So uh, I'll allude to that later, the 
the inner layer of the endovasculature has a, a what's called a glycocalyx, which is just this sugar layer that ends up getting shed out during the course of uh, the injury and resuscitation. Um, the vessels become increasingly permeable, and the, there is an inflammatory signal that goes on that causes the, ves the vasculature to become very sticky with respect to platelets as it recruits platelets and uh, innate immune cells. And so with those new considerations, that kind of takes us um, to the science that I'm going to try to describe today. So as I said, blunt thoracic trauma, um, in that setting, patients are more than twice as likely to have what is considered radiographically to be a pulmonary embolism. Um, however, increasingly we have become aware that that's likely a pulmonary, a primary pulmonary arterial thrombus. Um, and the evidence suggests that what you'll see is a clot formation usually within 96 hours of the initial injury, um, oftentimes in the absence of any kind of deep vein thrombosis to embolize. So we, we have a sense, although it hadn't been proven previously, that it was actually occurring in situ. So we wanted to study that phenomenon. And to do so, we created this really very simplistic model of lateral thoracic trauma, uh, which essentially consisted of a, a, a weight drop with a combined, with a, a known amount of energy onto the rib cage of a mouse that was placed in lateral decubitus uh, position. Um, it's actually a little bit of a tricky model because you want to do enough damage, but not too much damage where you would smash the mouse and kill it. And so you have to balance that. And we wanted to make sure we minimized any damage to other organ tissues, um, such as cardiac, skeletal muscle, or, or bone. So when we first did it, this is what we looked like, or what it looked like. And as you can see there, when you smash the mouse, you get a nice pulmonary contusion, and that's what it looks like uh, from a histological standpoint. As you can see all the infiltration of the blood into the air spaces, things like that. And then when we break it down a little bit further to look at the medium to small size vessels, we saw this de novo in situ pulmonary thrombosis that was occurring. We saw eccentric deposition of the fibrin. So it doesn't have the physical appearance of an embolic event, although that's a little bit of speculation. But as you can see, the fibrin sort of fills in from the sides and works its way in, more suggestive of a primary in situ event. Um, and then with immunofluorescence, we were able to demonstrate that we got good deposition of the fibrin, uh, just as we thought. And then just sort of to dot the I's and cross the T's, we wanted to characterize it and just make sure that it was what we thought it was. And we had a lot of local infiltration of innate immune cells, as well as um, concentrations increasing of chemokines and cytokines that we would have anticipated, like NCP1, for example. The next part that we wanted to do was to make sure that we didn't have a cardiac injury that was primarily pulmonary. Um, this will become a little bit more important and relevant uh, later on, and you'll see why. But I don't want to give away the whole surprise. Um, so to check out for a cardiac injury, we just checked the usual suspects. We made sure that the uh, level of myoglobin, CK, and B, and troponins were not changed, and they aren't compared to sham. Uh, injury. Um, also, we did a tunnel analysis. So um, yeah, are you all familiar with tunnel analysis? Anyone? I'm trying to engage you guys. So, <laughs> so basically what happens is um, when a cell starts to get sick or it starts on its road to epoptosis, uh, the phosphatidylserines and the, or the uh, sort of the cell layer in the wall will flip. And so you can stain for that to see if things are on the outside that are normally supposed to be on the inside. And what we saw was that um, we didn't have any cardiac injury, long story short, or nothing that was uh, relevant at this level of resolution. And then additionally, just to show that the cardiac function was fine, we wanted to make sure that the animals weren't particularly in a state of shock. And so we were able to demonstrate that they didn't become acidotic, more or less. So that's essentially what that was saying. 
So now that we had our model built, this allowed us to get to our hypothesis. And our hypothesis was basically that the in situ formation of clot would be dependent on a cell adhesion molecule that was recruiting the binding of platelets and, and also the, the deposition of fibrin there. Um, just in our understanding of sort of vasculature of the lung, we know that in the medium size um, or smaller arteries going into the arterioles, uh, one of the predominant um, cell adhesion molecules is, is, is what's called a selectin, which is a sugar bond protein. Um, P-selectin is, is that guy. And so what it does is it's expressed um, in endothelial cells and platelets, and it stays stored in these little packets, granules called alpha granules or weevil pallid bodies. And it sits there until the moment where the cell becomes agitated. And then at that time, those little granules will fuse to the surface of the cell. And so it will be expressed. So it sits ready. And you want it ready because you need to be able to react immediately to injury, right? You don't want to have to like synthesize a whole protein and process it in the current, you know, while you're, you know, that'd be like a trauma resuscitation where you got to go walk down to the, <laughs> we got to go get the cart and you, gotta, you don't want that. You want it all ready. And so that's the way it works. It sits there on standby and it, and it comes up to the surface. So we first wanted to see basically in our injury setting, was that piece selectin actually coming up to the surface of the cells and fusing and present where we thought it was. And it turns out it was. So basically, we had our mouse versus our sham mouse. And then when we injured the mice and we used immunofluorescence and stain to see if we saw um, a deposition of the, of the P-selectin present, it, it definitely was there lining the wall of the endothelium. Um, there was also some evidence of some of the shearing of the endothelium. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But the main point is that the P-selectin was where we needed it to be in order for the hypothesis to be tested. Furthermore, when we compared it to another cell adhesion molecule, which is found in, in smaller vessels still, ICAM-1, we saw that the distribution uh, of the P-selectin was in the right spot, but other cell uh, adhesion molecules like ICAM-1 were not present in that area. So this allowed us to really hone in on that one target molecule as our main suspect. And just a small point, we, this is just to illustrate something that I already said. In small vessels, the ICAM is, is, in, is present, but in the medium-sized to larger vessels, uh, it's P-selectin. And we chose those because we wanted to choose something that we thought would be more immediately clinically relevant, right? So if you clot off a really tiny vessel, at least acutely clinically, that probably won't have much of an effect unless you do it to like all of them. Um, but for the most part, you need a larger vessel to be occluded in order to have, you know, things like heart strain and things like that. Now we're not looking at the heart strain vessels where it's a little bit smaller. It's more like the segmental and subsegmental stuff, but it's still relevant. Um, so. so to that end, we wanted to investigate the role of P-selectin and the propagation and resolution of primary pulmonary arterial thrombus in this setting. We wanted to consider what would happen if we block this P-selectin interaction, could we block this clot formation? And then if we did that, would it have any detrimental consequences, right? Because anything you do, there's always a consequence. There's the anticipated ones and the unanticipated ones. In this setting, P-selectin is used to recruit platelets and to recruit innate immune cells. So potentially you could imagine that if you can't recruit platelets, you could potentially have increased bleeding. Um, you could also potentially, at least in theory, have an increased risk of infection in that compromised tissue if you can't get neutrophils to go there. Um, so the next thing we did was we actually wanted to see if we could block P-selectin. So we got a monoclonal antibody that could bind P-selectin and, and keep it from, from happening. And we use this um, in part because there are two clinically available monoclonal antibodies that are actually relevant, though not used for this purpose, but they already are existed and they've been tested by the FDA and shown to be safe in human beings. 
without uh, increased in infection in the uses that they've been using it for, interestingly. So what we did was initially we gave the mice either the antibody that blocked P-selectin or a control antibody, and then we smashed the mice. And then we looked to see if, uh, I should use a better terminology. And then we injured the mice. And then, uh, and then when we did that, we looked to see if the, um, if the P-selectin was present um, or not. And what we actually found was that, as you would anticipate when we use the control antibody, the fibrin was still present in the vessel wall. But when we had pretreated those animals uh, with the protective antibody, uh, we saw much, much less uh, fibrin deposition there. And so we had actually blocked the formation of the clot. So that was a big moment for us. And we were pretty excited about that. Um, I should say also, although I don't believe I show it in, in this slide, later on, we wanted to show the clinical relevance by actually giving the antibody after the injury, 30 minutes after, sort of like to kind of say like, oh, well, the patient got injured, and then they needed about 30 minutes to get to a place where they could get some definitive care. Will it still be able to block? And we found the same results. So I guess uh, based on that, we wanted to think about sort of what was happening in the clinical situation. And I'll just um, briefly summarize uh, with two things. I include this slide just to give props to one of my previous uh, trainees, Dr. Linda Schitzman, who's now at uh, University of Indiana. Um, but basically, um, two things happen in the, in the immediate vascular injury. So the first is that the glycocalyx, that inner lining of the wall, sort of washes out. Um, when you wash out that layer of sugars and things like that, that sets up increased permeability and also exposes the cell surface to allow for the expression of those cell adhesion molecules in a way where they're more easily potentially seen by the innate cells in the platelets. And then you get that fibrin uh, accumulation that occurs. It also, it turns out, you have a process that occurs where proteases come and cleave off some of that P-selectin, uh, likely because you're trying to maintain a homeostasis where you don't um, overclot. And so everything coagulation is about balance and you're pushing that balance one way or the other in resuscitation for trauma, um, either towards clot formation or towards fibrinolysis um, because you need to stop the bleed, but you don't want to make the tissue ischemic by doing it any longer than you need to. And so we're shifting that balance, okay? Um, additionally, it is worth noting also that with classical pulmonary emboli and others, although it hasn't been studied for this because nobody really knew about primary pulmonary arterial thrombosis and could compare or separate the two historically, about three to 5% of patients will end up with a long-term clot that stays in that lung tissue and they can develop pulmonary hypertension as a result of that. Um, it's also probably an underdiagnosed condition. It probably occurs, but it may be more or less clinically relevant depending on the patient. Um, but we wanted to look sort of at what happened in our model in terms of like duration and prolongation of that clot being present. Um, and could it be sort of an early model for vascular remodeling and the things that occur to set up subsequent pulmonary hypertension development? Um, and I'll tell you, the thing that actually got me interested in this, just so that you have a kind of a context for this, is the fact that, you know, wars were being fought in Iraq and Afghanistan in which there were a lot of um, I, uh, improvised explosive devices. And when you get blast injury to the chest, that seems like it would be a perfect setup for the formation of primary pulmonary arterial thrombus. And so with those wars having started about 20 years ago, right now would be about the time where if there was going to be a development of pulmonary hypertension, it should start showing up in veterans. And so we were just sort of interested in, in looking at that as a possibility. But first, you know, I'm the basic guy. I'm not the 
the Clinton follow-up guy. But um, so I wanted to see if our model would allow us to see that. And I shared this with you um, just because it's important to understand that basic science um, can be hard. Uh, so what we saw notably was that while P-selectin expression in fibrin persisted for two weeks, um, or for a week, it, it often was resolved at two weeks, and I, I might have put my slide out of out of order there. But um, the model is tricky in that, with a small animal model, you can only injure them so much before you do too much damage, and so they can't take the amount of energy that you would need for a much larger clot burden, and um, to see kind of the development of that. So our clots tended to be resolving by the fourteen day period. Um, that being said, there was some interesting things that we did see that might have been a precursor to what we would be looking for in the long term. Um, what we would often see is an image like this. Um, and what that is, is a very unusual thing. So as I said earlier, typically when we talk about P-select and expression, we talk about the platelets and the endothelial cells expressing it. But what that actually is an image of is P-selectin staining on the musculature that's in the media of the vessel. Um, when we saw that, we didn't know exactly what to think, but it turns out in the literature, there are some models of vascular injury where they use um, essentially like very small metal pipe to go through the vessel and strip the intima out to cause uh, vascular injury. And in those models also reported that P-selectin staining is present on the musculature. Now, how it gets there, I, I can't exactly tell you, and we haven't worked out that molecular part. Um, but it is interesting because that in the other models is associated with subsequent vascular remodeling. And so it is possible that what we have here is a, at least the beginnings of a model for a long-term chronic uh, issue like chronic thrombo thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension uh, that we can subsequently um, investigate, at least in the mouse. But also, of course, um, it still begs for a large animal model where we could sort of do it a little bit more definitively. And that sort of wraps that part up. And it just shows that basically at 14 days, uh, we saw that the fibrin was all gone. And so that was definitely a challenge of the small animal model. But, um, you know, you're going to have some challenges and then you're going to have some opportunities. And that's just the way it goes. And then we had uh, a student who's now a, a, a pulmonary critical care um, fellow who's, uh, or at least a resident uh, who is uh, investigating the expression of a protein called KI67, which is a nuclear protein uh, associated with cellular proliferation. And that project is still ongoing. We, we'd never quite finished it, but it, that's how we're looking to see if the vascular remodeling uh, goes up. The next question that we wanted to ask is in our model, are there other secondary injuries that might be associated uh, with this injury. Now we know that um, because of the way that the weight hits, um, that it is confined to the thoracic cavity. And so we wanted to see if there were other injuries like in a, in a non-thoracic organ. So we wanna look at the kidneys. And so uh, we wanted to do that in a couple of ways. And I just have this slide up to highlight uh, some of the characters who helped us out with that uh, Juby and Jim Becker, who's now a, a, a critical care doctor in, at Kaiser. Um, but the, what we wanted to look at was acute kidney injury in the model. So when we injured our animals and we looked at the kidney histology, indeed we saw that there was some epithelial cell necrosis and the tubularized cells normally have a certain polarity to them and that polarity was lost. And all that is indicative of an acute kidney injury. Um, to, we also saw that they had increased uh, protein excretion in their urine, which would be associated also with a, with a kidney injury. Um, so our next step was to look a little bit deeper at a higher resolution uh, through expression of a protein called KIM1, which is a protein that is expressed in the setting of renal injury. And indeed, 
um, the expression of KM1 was higher in animals that uh, had been injured. So mechanistically, when we want to consider why the animals had uh, a renal injury, it is worth going back to our previous uh, findings that these animals did not have any excess myoglobin or CK, which is one mechanism that was considered for renal injury uh, historically. Um, also, these animals were never in shock, and we can't demonstrate definitively that there isn't a small period of time where there's underperfusion of the of the kidneys, but we know that our animals never accumulated any kind of base deficit or had any pH changes. So we don't believe necessarily that there was a um, sort of a, a hypoperfusion situation. So the step that we're at now is to demonstrate whether or not it is connected with the P-selectin aspects of the injury and some of that uh, being released and causing sort of a passive accumulation of clot uh, in the tissue downstream and causing obstruction ischemia type injury. So we know that in our injured animals, um, there will be some secretion of, of P-selectin. Uh, it's important to also understand though that there's, when you look at soluble P-selectin, some of it is inactive. So when it's in its monomeric form, it's just basically a marker of injury, but it doesn't really have much of a known uh, impact on, on clotting. Um, however, if it ends up sort of free, but in, in dimeric or, or polymeric uh, forms, it can actually instigate the formation of, of small little microclot. So the next thing we wanted to test was sort of, at least in theory, if we had small amounts of activated P-selectin present in the circulation, could it actually cause injury to the tissues? So we basically gave animals um, this form of activated P-selectin in a soluble way in the setting or absence of an injury. And the interesting thing that we saw was that when we gave that activated P-selectin and injured the animals, the clots that we saw We're like, we're, we're really occlusive. They were much bigger, much more great in magnitude. Um, and so that was great. But the actually, one of the more interesting things was the little box over here. Uh, the reason that that control is interesting is that's an animal that was given the activated P-selectin but that animal was not injured. And in the absence of a vascular injury, that P-selectin had no impact uh, in that vessel. Um, we didn't see any passive deposition and we didn't see any increased uh, clot formation. So it looks like there has to be an interaction uh, with the vessel in order to get the damage. Um, this sort of brings me to one little tiny tangent. Um, that I will say, and it's just in consideration of coagulopathy, which we always do in trauma and we're thinking about how to study it. We study the things that are easy to do. And so we can easily take blood out of a patient and see within that blood what is happening in terms of coagulation. But the thing that we can't easily do is take a blood vessel out of the patient and see what the interaction is between the blood and the actual vessel. And so every test that we do essentially lacks a very critical part of the coagulation pathway, which is the status of that endovasculature. And so that's worth consideration uh, whenever you're thinking about that or in any future study designs. And so uh, we find that fascinating. So getting back to the original uh, idea of blocking um, P-selectin and preventing the clot formation from happening, I think the, the questions that you want to ask are, one, how long can you give the P-selectin where it will still be effective? Um, two, does this have a detrimental impact on systemic coagulation? Are you going to hurt your patients and cause them to bleed more? Uh, and three, are you going to block the ability of that patient to heal tissue or to um, fight infection locally in that tissue um, where normally immune cells would have been recruited by that P-selectin? So to that end, we did a couple of tests. 
Um, we started off with some of the simple ones that everyone is familiar with, PT, PTT. Um, and what we found was that while P-selectin did increase proframin time, uh, partial uh, PTT was not impacted at all. And what we saw in, in conjunction with that was that fibrinogen seemed to be consumed uh, in the setting of the uh, administration of, of the anti-P-selectin um, with the setting of trauma. It seemed to be a little bit more significantly consumed. The next study we did was uh, that of uh, viscoelastic clotting properties. So this was essentially an equivalent or sort of a, a similar type of uh, assay to what we would call like TAG or, or ROTIM. We wanted to look essentially at the ability uh, of this of the clot formation and how long it took and what was the maximal amplitude, for example. And what we saw was that either at 15 minutes or at 60 minutes after injury, none of the viscoelastic properties uh, in terms of clotting time or clot formation time um, or, or maximal like clot formation, they didn't appear to be affected in any way detrimentally. So we didn't see at least uh, from the blood it taken out um, any changes. So we wanted to take that and we wanted to give it more of an ultimate test. So if you remember back to the case, that patient had a head bleed and that patient ended up um, getting a worse head bleed after that patient was initially given heparin. And so we wanted to know if you took an animal that had a TBI in the sitting and you gave it uh, anti-P selectin, are you gonna worsen the, the TBI and, and cause an injury? So the team put together a small cortical contusion impactor and did the study and what they found uh, was essentially that the P-selectin uh, blockade didn't increase the hemorrhage um, in that TBI model. Um, and in fact, we had sort of the equivalent of a high dose, like therapeutic dose uh, of heparin in that model. And that actually showed some uh, increase in bleeding, but even the therapeutic, or the prophylactic type dose equivalent did not cause increased bleeding in that model. But that was encouraging. And so kind of to put it all together, um, in summary from the studies that I've shown there, uh, basically, first, we wanted to demonstrate that primary pulmonary arterial thrombosis was a distinct entity from pulmonary embolism. And we believe that we were able to show that the fibrin uh, appeared to be um, deposited in an eccentric fashion and that it was a local in situ event. We did not in the model test for DVTs, but we also tested uh, within 24 hours. And so uh, we believe that it was all in situ. Um, two, we demonstrated that this thrombosis formation was able to be prevented by the administration of a monoclonal antibody um, developed or that was uh, given specifically to block P-selectin. So P-selectin appeared to be necessary, essential for this clot formation. Um, and then at least in our early studies, we did not appear to um, impact the systemic coagulation in these animals. So moving forward, what we'd like to do is to a little bit more completely understand, possibly in a, in a larger animal model, what the natural history is of the propagation versus resolution of primary pulmonary arterial thrombosis, sort of what the natural history of it is. Um, we think also that just because of the nature of local vascular injury, that this might be more of a precursor for long-term persistence and development of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. We speculate that. We don't have any data on that, but that's just kind of one of the directions that we want to, to take it in, uh, in terms of that uh, vascular remodeling and development of, of hypertension. Uh, we see P-selectin as a potential alternative to treatments like heparin, which are difficult to use acutely in the setting of, of polytrauma, um, particularly in the setting of, of solid organ injury or traumatic brain injury. Um, and then uh, taking it a step ahead, we see a lot of relevance in a lot of different areas because I believe that in the setting of any acute vascular injury, you're going to get local uh, surface expression of various cell adhesion molecules. 
And so when you consider the relevance of this and you think about things like vascular trauma, reanastomosis, and whether or not your, your, your repair is gonna go down or when you're looking at microvascular repair, like in plastics or hand surgeries and, and you want to make sure that your thumb is gonna be perfused or whatever. And you wanna kind of be able to understand sort of what is driving whether or not the graft or the repair is gonna take or, or fail. I think that this offers us a little bit of key insight as to some of the things to be looking for. And I think that down the road, what we'll be investigating is sort of the breakdown and restoration of the glycocalyx locally at that anastomotic uh, site, as well as the expression uh, and how and the duration of expression of the surface adhesion molecules right at that at that level. So I, I see relevance potentially transplant plastics. Um, you know, even in the setting of pancreatitis, you'll oftentimes get arterial thrombosis, right? Just because of the, the local inflammation. But I, I think that it kind of holds a little bit of emphasis to, to look at it across many different uh, surgical disciplines. So I'll just leave it there, which I think is right on time. And I just want to acknowledge uh, past members of the lab, support from the department, uh, Chair Dr. Farmer, uh, Division Chief Dr. Calcutt, um, and then all the past members of the lab who've kind of helped uh, contribute some of this work, as well as support uh, from the American Surgical Association Foundation Fellowship Program, uh, the AAST, the East Invest C program, which is a really uh, something to look into uh, for those of you who don't know. So with East, you can apply for early investigator uh, research uh, awards, and sometimes you know, not everybody can win, but what they can do is uh, they can take people who have really good ideas and they'll all meet and provide some really great one-on-one -on -one mentorship and help you further develop the project for subsequent um, submissions. And that really helped a lot with the AAST submission subsequently. Um, also support from the AAMC and the Society of Black Academic Surgeons. So uh, with that, thank you. And I look forward to your questions. So from, oh, well. Oh, that's true. Yeah, so as you can see the question from Dr. Langdale, is there any evidence that shedding of P-selectin is altered in stored platelets? Uh, the kind of patient presented would likely have required a massive transfusion approach, including platelet transfusion. Uh, so that is a fascinating question. Um, we have not directly looked into that. I think that the nature of P-selectin being present in the granules uh, rather than on the surface sort of protects it from the cleavage by the proteases, at least until... Um, the time that they're activated once they hit the uh, inpatient setting. Um, so I think that's protective, but what I think is relevant and sort of a subsequent sort of follow up to that question is whether or not the granules themselves are depleted by storage. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's a fascinating question. Yeah, Dr. Brown, I, I have a question. You talked about the window where one can uh, still have an effective intervention, and you also showed the studies of uh, whether this affected coagulation uh, negatively. What do you know so far about the window of opportunity for intervention? And I know that you're you're still evolving in this, but from what you know now, what what do you imagine? five years from now that we might be doing with blood trauma patients based upon what your research is showing? 
What I imagine, actually for trauma patients in general, um, is the administration of something like this, um, particularly either in the setting of blunt thoracic trauma to prevent uh, or treat these injuries, which we don't know yet if, we can, if it actually can help shift the equilibrium to reverse the subsequent expansion of clots that are already present or not. But we believe that because it is an equilibrium kind of shift thing, homeostasis thing, that we might be able to move things back even when they're already present. Um, but I, I imagine what we do know is that the window is at least an, an hour or so, but we would like to see if it's much further out because I think that for it to be really relevant, it would be nice to have a nice window, like two, three hours or so. Um, we don't see clot formation in our animals usually in the first six hours. So um, we, that's not published data, but just in developing, we tended to have to wait at least 24 hours to get good resolution of clot formation by immunofluorescence. Uh, so it's likely a bigger window than that. So that'd be great. I also though, in the setting of trauma would say that things like ischemia, reperfusion type injuries are going to exacerbate the inflammation locally in, in vasculature. And so those are settings where I would anticipate um, selectin or ICAM expression to occur. So I imagine that in tissue that's been somewhat devitalized where you're trying to do vascular repairs and restore that tissue, there's going to be some risk of the vessels coming down just because the, the injured vessels are gonna be a little bit inflamed. Um, you will normally you, you excise stuff that looks a little bit ratty, but you know, that's gross and that's not, uh, so that's at the gross level of resolution. It's not at the microscopic level of sort of what the ex, um, expression is on the surface of the cell adhesion molecules. But I imagine that when we are looking at things like traumatic amputations and, and, and reattachments and things like that, that we're going to not just sew the vessels back together, but we're actually going to try to address um, keeping the repairs open on a molecular level by blockade of selectins and, and ICAMs. Well, yeah, just before we ask the next question, I want to follow up on that point because we have some of our transplant surgeons here. So we have daily models of ischemia reperfusion in, in practice. And and how do you anticipate this might be applied? In yeah, so we need to see basically if the same thing is going to happen. I imagine just because with transplant, it's a more um, controlled environment. Um, you don't have issues like uh, hypotension and things like that that are going to cause more of the glycocalyx disruption that you'd have potentially in trauma. So it, it may or may not be as impactful. Um, we were actually talking yesterday in the group about whether or not this is something that's seen in transplant and it is something that kind of follow up with. Um, but yeah, I, I, I anticipate a relevance, but we have to see. So, yeah. Uh, so we have a, another question from Teresa Kim. Congratulate you on your talk and your work. She asked, is it known how to risk stratify or predict which blood trauma patients will develop these types of pulmonary artery clots? And is soluble P-selectin or something more nuanced uh, to be selected for the right patients who would benefit from something like this blood? Yeah, so we don't know how to stratify. And the problem with the selectin is that um, it could come from anywhere. And so in a polytrauma, you're not going to know if it's uh, specifically getting shed at the site of the lungs or if it's getting shed at the site of the leg or whatever else got injured in, in the thing. So we're not quite there yet. Um, uh, I think one of the ways to do this, though, is you can do things like intravital microscopy uh, in models and see kind of if there is some sort of predictive pattern uh, to um, kind of follow up and, and use that to predict. Now, that won't necessarily make it to the clinical setting, but it might give us a clue as to what to co correlate with the findings of intravital microscopy that we can follow clinically. Yeah. There's still this ongoing debate as to prolonging the patency of big grafts, especially because it's still the most commonly used graft for bypass surgery. 
do you see any relevance? And, and now the, the most common technique for targeting is endoscopic um, targeting, which we all cause direct trauma to our conduits. Do you see any application or are you aware of any studying, you know, perhaps treating the conduits um, or giving the patients uh, yeah. some of the So I would say that um, what's actually interesting is that the P-selected monoclonal antibodies that are used clinically were actually developed for coronary uh, interventions. Um, and so th there is a history there of people looking. Um, I think sort of probably mixed results there because it's not something that you hear about being used all the time. And in fact, P-selectin antibodies now clinically tend to be used more for sickle cell anemia patients. Um, but I do think that people have started uh, walking down that trail to see sort of uh, if they can uh, enhance uh, graft prolongation by, by blocking that initial uh, interaction and seeing if one acutely you don't have clot, but then long term, does that also mean you have less vascular remodeling and hypertrophy and things like that that end up causing the stenosis? So yeah, great question. Dr. Bain. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So I think uh, Dr. Knudsen from uh, UCSF is doing a lot of work in this area and looking at uh, sort of which thrombi need to be treated or not, particularly in this setting of primary pulmonary arterial thrombus. I think what we typically will do right now is not treat anything that's like subsegmental or, or even segmental as long as there's no um, implication in terms of like cardiac strain and things like that. And a lot of times we get away with that and sort of that has been what we do. Um, I think right now we're in this stage where we are managing what is acute. I think that we get away with that because the incidence of chronic thrombotic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is so low that we can sort of let a lot of it slide, at least we think we can. Um, so we may be playing, paying a small price for limited our, our group of treatment or not. But I think what you have to do first is you can do a, you know, as Dr. Gerlach, who trained me, he said, you can do a lot more with a live patient than a, than a dead one. And so acutely, um, I would say we, we sort of treat what we need to treat. And that means probably letting the subsegmental and segmental and sort of the smaller level things go as we can. And then in the situations like we had in the case study where the patient required ECMO, then we just have to do it on a case by case basis. But there's, yeah, there's some work uh, going on there. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I heard this really incredible talk about pancreatitis and complications of pancreatitis and how you often end up with um, the degree of inflammation that you have surrounding the vessels sort of like spills into the vessels and then you get clotting of that tissue. You also see the same, of course, in, in, in soft tissue, um, you know, necrosis and, and things like that, where you have a lot of issues where, where you have these, these clotting events. So I believe that there is a relevance. I think that you have to look very specifically at the vessels that are clotting off in each setting and, and how big or small they are, because that's going to help determine, and their location, and it's going to help determine specifically which um, cell adhesion molecules are the ones of interest uh, for that tissue. So I think probably the conceptually, yes, um, but then more needs to be teased out to say, you know, sort of which ones can be blocked. And what are the consequences of that? Because again, Selectins and, and ICAMs are used to bring in immune cells. So if in the, in, the, in the setting of infection, if you're blocking that, are you hurting yourself or are you helping yourself? Uh, and I think that that sort of depends on how local or non-local the coagulation issue is. So, yeah. Thank you all so much. Like the most questions I've ever gotten. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>
how Seth got here, patient in a world where kind of like you gave aspirants to stroke patients where you know EMTs have this and how do you what are you envisioning as the patient gets this in the ambulance or as they're walking in advice of the building to the ER? I'm hoping that we can do it in the in the trauma bay uh, rather than in the in the ER. I'm hoping that the that the therapeutic window will be wide enough that we can get a little bit more information on the on the whole context of the patient because I, I think that just drawing it in, you know, anything in science, there's consequences that you anticipate, and then there's a whole lot of consequences that you just really didn't know what you were messing with, and and I think that. Um, I think probably the more information you can get before you would do this would be the better. And I think that we'll probably have a good enough window to be able to do it once uh, patients get in and we get some more information. Thank you all. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, it's been a fantastic talk. And as she said, you know, lots, lots of questions and things uh, remain to be seen as it as it continues to unfold. So please, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, do look for the evaluation forms to come to you later today. Thanks.